All right, guys, welcome to the class. I will be giving you uh, today. We'll make progress on the theory part and we'll make progress on the. Um, lab part and both of these things will happen today. All right. First, I'll start by mentioning the collaterals of the class that you should have uh, received. One is, oh, now I should go with a pen. One is class material. Are you guys able to see and read what I'm writing? Yes, Asaf. One is lecture two. Lecture two on YouTube. Now, this lecture three will also get posted onto YouTube right after this class. The second is Slack. The Slack invitation I sent to quite a few of you. Some of you accepted it. Uh, some of you have still not accepted the Slack. So I have not been posting any messages on Slack. Please do accept it. What it means is that if you get stuck, you can take help from each other. And I'll be monitoring the Slack and stepping in to answer questions. So it is of value to you. As you do your lab, you can post screenshots, you can post files, you can post tips. You can, you can say, I'm stuck here. This is what my error message looks like and so forth. It is worth using it. Then there is a Google mailing list, Google group. Mailing list. Mailing list. If you have not received an invite, and I should know, this is for announcement purposes. I wouldn't be using it for much interactivity between us, but this is where I inform if the, anything about the class or post material, you know, send out material links and so forth. So these are our main things. At the same time, I sent a, a PDF. PDF of was given last lecture, was given last lecture, and today, updated today. If I remember right, uh, see if you have received a PDF or you do have access to a PDF, which is approximately 25 pages long. If you don't have it, then let me know. In any case, I've updated it, and now it's approximately, it is actually 50 pages long, updated today. And I will post it to you guys right after this class. Yeah, I don't have it. Okay, so all of you who don't have it in an email, let me know what things you don't have. So this is the class material. Today, what are we going to do? Today, we are going to cover the topic of regression. Regression. In particular, we will do linear regression. will be on the theory side of it. We will learn about, second thing we'll learn about is a bias variance trade-off, a topic called uh, bias variance. And it's very important when we select a model, bias variance trade-offs. We will do this. The time permitting, we will also do uh, model diagnostics. These will be the main topics on the theory side. On the lab side, let me use a different color for the lab. Um, lab. Side. I'll walk you through the solution. Uh, where am I? Lab, I'll be walking you through solutions. Or rather, let me not write solutions. Um, walk through. To data analysis. Exercises. Exercises. There will be, you, you folks have already done the Galton. In my notes, I left uh, an influence Nightingale was simple. 
uh, John, did any one of you manage to visualize uh, John Snow's data? I don't remember if you want, if you did or not, but I'll be releasing the solutions. But today I'm going to do the weather data. I will talk about the concept of tidy data. When you actually practice data science, one of the most important concepts is that of tidy data. Data comes quite noisy. It comes in all sorts of forms and it comes from heterogeneous sources. It can come from a file, it can come from, in file it may come as a CSV, it may come as a tab separated file, XML, JSON, or you name it. It can come from a database. The database can be a relational database that you can access through SQL queries. It may be a non-relational database, such as Mongo, a document-oriented database, a graph database, and uh, all sorts of NoSQL databases. It could come from a remote location, for example. It can come from a URL. So when you get data from different sources and when you have to um, manipulate the data, to put it in a form that you want, it's a process, it's a journey. and in that journey, one of the important concepts is that of tidy data. Tidy data says that ultimately your data should look a certain way, and if it does look a certain way, exploratory analysis and subsequently machine learning on that data becomes uh, much more straightforward. So we'll learn about the concept of tidy data. We will learn about the concept of grammar. Grammar. Now, grammar... If you remember, what is grammar? Grammar tells us whether a sentence is right or wrong. It has a, a structure, for example, a noun, a verb, uh, you know, subject, uh, object, predicates, and all sorts of verbs and adjectives and adverbs. Those are the things. And how do you weave those pieces together is the grammar for the English language. Once you are clear with the grammar, you can create all sorts of sentences. In the same way, this process, this uh, data manipulation and data wrangling, you can consider it to have a specific grammar, grammar of data. Data manipulation. And grammar of graphics. The concept is very powerful. People used to make graphs in all sorts of ways. It used to be pretty, uh, every, everybody's API looked completely different. You had to remember a lot of things. It was a nuisance to learn yet another data graph plotting API and so forth. So one day, um, there was a lot of thinking about it and people came up with the concept of the grammar of graphics, a very influential work. It's actually a book, very influential book. Based on the grammar of graphics, a few libraries came into existence. One of the libraries, or two of the libraries, are very popular. One of them is called D3, D3.js. Uh, in the JavaScript world, it's extremely popular. And the other is, in, uh, in the world of R and Python, it is called ggplot, grammar of graphics plotting. Today, we are going to learn a little bit about that, but much more we are going to learn about a grammar to just manipulate data. What is it that we need? A systematic uh, vocabulary of verbs that will help us do any data manipulation in an elegant and clean manner. And it is uh, worth learning that. So that is the scope of today's lecture. So far, so good, thing. So with that, I will uh, start now with today. Um, our topic today will be lean, linear. Let's start with something called linear regression. Linear regression. Before I start, I'll just remind you that we learned last time the concept of uh, correlation, covariance, regression towards the mean. Do we remember those concepts, guys? Does anybody feel that we should review all of that? Or can we move past that now? I think I'll move past that. Um, so linear regression, 
linear regression is so what is regression first look at the word regression regression is oddly named for historic reasons that we talked about in regression we think of it as a box right? a sort of a box inside the box here yeah, some features go in from our data x1 x2 xn and out comes a prediction and this is a model or a box of some sort. What it means, this is the vocabulary that people use. Think of it as a black box of kind. And it need not be black. Sometimes it's very easy to understand, but uh, for the time being, consider it a box. The input to that can be the features. And it can be more than one features. Let's take the example of sale of ice cream on the beach that we use as a reference example. X1 can be temperature, X2 can be day of the week, X3 can be a wind, how windy it is. And so likewise, different features can go in. Uh, these are called uh, the explanatory variables and many words are used by people. Then why is the output? or the response or the prediction. So people use uh, all sorts of vocabulary coming from dis different disciplines, but I'll just use the vocabulary, a simplified look vocabulary. I'll call it input features. And this I'll call the response. Are we clear guys? So X, you can write it as a vector for those of you who are uh, well versed with vectors. And y is just a number. y hat is essentially a real number. So uh, remember that this blackboard R stands for real number. Right? An example of a real number is, for example, pi or 3 or 1 or 2. All of these are real numbers, positive or negative, fractional or a whole or irrational, they all together form the set of real numbers or the world field of real numbers. Now, inputs can be either real numbers or they can be categorical. So let's uh, talk about the two kinds of input at this particular moment, two kinds of variables. One of them is real real valued what does it stand for real valued example let's say uh, you sold a uh, 320 buckets of ice cream well that's a lot 320 instances of ice cream got sold huh? so 320 is an example 4.5 is some an example, temperature of 72 and uh, 3 degrees is an example, and so on and so forth. These are all real numbers. Pi is an example, if you want, an irrational number. Then the other type of data or variable that we talk about are called the categorical. I'll use the word categorical. C for that. This is a symbol for this. Categorical. So these are things that are not numbers at all. They are cats and dogs, for example, or a day of the week is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You realize that there is no point in assigning a number to it because the moment you call Monday equal to two and Wednesday equal to, I don't know, four, it immediately implies that somehow Wednesday is more than Monday. But then right after Wednesday will eventually come a Monday and so forth. So in other words, it does not make sense to assign a number to categorical because numbers have an ordinality, implied ordinality to them. So these are categoricals. For the time being, there are more to it. There's, for example, date and other things which need to be converted to real values and things. But for, uh, for the purposes of our learning, we will limit ourselves to only these two data types. So far, so good, guys. So can somebody give me another example of a categorical? One of you, if you can unmute yourself and give me some example. Like a true or false. 
True or false? Very good. Day of the week. In fact, booleans. Male, female. Boolean. Yeah, male, female. Uh, so, uh, booleans. True. False. Uh, gender, yeah, male, female. Yeah, male, female. Yes, male, female is another great example. Boolean is categorical too. We'll just treat it as categorical, not uh, and if as categorical too. Uh, is zip code categorical? Yes, because there is a finite set of zip code. So the criteria for categorical is that uh, it must be categorical, must be a finite set. Uh, let me highlight this, must be. finite set. So this is a very important requirement. I'll just highlight this. If it is not finite, then it is not categorical. One example is this, the sentences in the English language. How many sentences can there be in the English language? They can be infinite or in any language, it's an infinite set. People can create all sorts of sentences or the paragraphs and so forth. Because it's an infinite set, you wouldn't call sentences a categorical variable. Are we together? So you must know that it is a finite set. Then only it qualifies as a categorical variable. A Boolean is, of course, the simplest example. It is true or false. So it does qualify. Right? Gender qualifies because, you know, you can have male, female, and a couple of other genders, but it's a pretty small set. So, uh, and so forth. So this is the definition of the two kinds of inputs and outputs that we will deal with. Next comes the question, what is regression? Regression is a box that takes in, uh, think of it as an imaginary box, and you feed it input features, a data, uh, data point, which is represented as input data. So think of it as uh, regression, takes a, an input datum x, which is represented as x1, x2, xt, right? So uh, as an e example could be temperature, temperature, pressure, uh, wind, rain, amount of rain. So what will that be? If on any given day you can tell uh, these four things, let us say, uh, and you can build a model or a prediction system, or some sort of a relationship or a concept between uh, input and output, a hypothesis relationship, then this is your x vector. Are we together, guys? In simple terms, it's a tuple. You can think of it as simply a list or a tuple of values or variable values. So x goes in, and so more formally, you can just write it in this notation. x vector goes in, and y hat comes out. Now, y hat is not a vector. By the way, why am I putting a hat? Just to recapitulate, this hat signifies, hat signifies, sure. what does it signify? Prediction. A prediction, thank you. A prediction. Uh, and why, the actual data would be why. Remember, uh, we use y for data, y hat for predictions. So a prediction comes out. This is a model. Now, what is in here? How is it that a box can take an input and produce an output? We will now learn ways to build this box. So, so far so good, guys. Can I scroll, uh, scroll up a little bit? Yes, sir. So let's take this. 
and ask what we can do. So one thing we can do is, let's say we look at the data. We looked at this data, and let's say that your data is like this. Um, let me take a color of the data. The simplest example that we took. And we said that this is your Y and this is your X. In this direction, it is your X and Y. Just looking at this data, one comes up, uh, or sort of it gives us an idea that perhaps there is a linear relationship between X and Y, isn't it? So one may hypothesize, just looking at this data, that the relationship could be something like, uh, let me take this, this could be a relationship, let's say, uh, approximately. So when we hypothesize that this is a relationship, this, this is our hypothesis or model. Or model. This hypothesis we can write in the case of mathematically, we can write it as beta naught plus beta one x. So this is to recapitulate what we did. Now the Greek letter stands for uh, the pieces of our hypothesis, of our model, of our abstract notation. Right? The x and y stand for data. The Roman uh, letters they stand for the actual data itself. So we can hypothesize a relationship. People often write it like this, but actually there's a, to be much more precise, what you say is that is beta naught plus beta one uh, plus an error term, a term which represents these errors. You know, there'll always be errors at any given time. And these errors are the residuals. You can see that they are residuals. Uh, so more appropriately, this particular part of the term is your Y hat. This is what your box predicts. Are we together? So this makes for a model that we can find the model that makes the best prediction. So how do we find that? We know that we are in search of a line. We just need to find the line, that line, which gives us the least total error. So first, and this is a recapitulation of what we did, we have to do two things. There's an old statement, actually, I keep quoting uh, by, um, Kevin, uh, one of the great physicists of thermodynamics, uh, who said that for, for you to improve on anything, you must first quantify it. You must measure in order to improve. Right? Roughly speaking, Kevin, Kelvin, or is it Kelvin? Kelvin, the physicist, uh, actually, let me write it in a better way. Uh, some of you may know about Lord Kelvin if you have done physics. Uh, he was very influential in thermodynamics. He says, to improve, first you must measure. To improve, first you must be able to measure. He didn't say it in quite those words, but we'll say it like this. His uh, actual language is uh, quite beautiful. If anybody is interested, I invite you to look it up in the way he uh, he said it. So in our case, uh, what is it that we are trying to measure? We realize that we need to quantify the error, the total error, actually, let me use the E term, the error, the error. First, we need to write this error and we realize that we could write it in this way. We take the prediction and we look at uh, the, the actual value and the prediction. So these are the gaps, these are the mistakes. Uh, for the ith point, xi, this part is y i hat, and this part is the actual y i. So far, so good, guys. You realize that, isn't it? Yes. But this part, and therefore, this is the residual r i is y i minus y i hat. Right? So, this is the error of this particular prediction. And when we take the error of all the predictions, so this is our residues. So uh, you, to compute the error, we have Ri is equal to this. Now we know that somehow we need to uh, collect all these residues. And 
Because the residues can be positive or they could be negative, like for example, this is a negative residue, uh, we need some way to just look at the magnitude of the residues. So let us say that we have, a the, and so this is much more interesting, yi minus yi hat, the, the, the size of the residue. So one of the ways we can do it is we can uh, create the total residue by summing over just the absolute values, or you could do, uh, so there are many, many ways that you can formulate the error term, right? And people call it the loss, the uh, so on and so forth. So you can write it literally as summed over. So the sigma stands for sum, summing over all the residues, ag aggregating or collecting all the residues. So you can do this. And that is okay, but not common, not common. Not common. The more common term is E is equal to Ri squared. So one way to get positive quantity is just to square this term. If I square Ri, you realize that whether the residue is positive or negative, uh, it will become positive one way or the other. And so this particular way of writing it, which is the uh, sum square, sum of squares, of the residuals, actually I keep using the word residue, but the, temp, the term is residuals, square of residuals. So this is the term, it turns out, that is most common, commonly used. It, not because it is, uh, it is the only correct way of doing it, but it certainly is uh, the most common. And now the question is, why is it most common? So that has to do with, uh, theorem that was created by Gauss and Markov. There is a Gauss-Markov theorem, and behind that theorem is an assumption. It says that if you build a model, the Gauss-Markov assumptions, the Gauss-Markov assumption, what does it say? I'll give you the intuition for it. And... Uh, you can, I won't give you all the terms. It is often called the line assumption. Line assumption. And I'll, I'll invite you to go look up what the line assumption, uh, what are the, what the word L-I-N-E mean. It's an acronym, right? So uh, you, can, you can do that, but I'll give you the intuition here. See, first of all, the, for, if you make a linear model, your data, it better be linear, because if the data is non-linear, then it doesn't make sense to make a linear model. So for example, if your data is like this, a non-linear data, like if your data is like this, would you call this a linear model? Uh, would you call that it meets a linearity assumption? of the data. So this would not be a linear, a not linear data, non-linear data. Right. So it wouldn't do. The other assumption is that uh, you must have the data more, a lot more small errors rather than big errors. In other words, the epsilons, the error terms, the error terms so number one, one. The second thing that you want, and again, let me scroll down a little bit. And uh, guys, I'll send you guys this notebook, sir, as a PDF. The second assumption is that the error terms, you know, all these residuals, epsilon i or r i, uh, these are the terms we use. It must, if you look at all of these values, they must be close, more close to zero than away from it. In other words, they must form a bell curve. If you, if you plot all the error terms, whether you call it Ri or uh, let me just call it Ri here. Uh, in your model, at the end of the day, uh, your, this is a zero. So people use an interesting notation. Uh, they use a very scripted, N, 
for error for the residue let me just call it error whose center is zero and whose uh, spread is well it is some standard deviation it is spread around the um, the zero value which makes sense you know most of the data should be close to the line if they are not close to the line the line probably doesn't reflect the data do you see how intuitive this is if you look at this as i'm at this thing the whole point of the line is it's as close to the data as possible so therefore it is representative of the relationship uh, uh, embedded in the data which means that the departures from the line of the data points those residues uh, most of them should be small and very only a few should be large and so the error terms they should have a gaussian distribution or a normal distribution there's an interesting historic uh, uh, aside to it the concept of a normal distribution or the uh, came about actually by studying the errors people were trying to come up with a um, proper representation for error terms we realize that in most situations errors are small and uh, large errors are fewer so if you if you take it and you say uh, i'm going to look at errors so that they are symmetric they're equally symmetric they're positive errors versus negative errors are equally likely in any given situation and that errors have a smooth smooth distribution and you know the continuous smooth distributions etc under certain conditions you'll realize that the function that satisfies that is the normal distribution and that is how the normal distribution or the gaussian distribution was created or discovered it has a it has a it's sort of a complicated structure. I'll just mention it. It is a function of n given mu sigma square, and it is equal to 1 over 2 pi sigma exponential of e to the minus x minus mu over sigma square a half. Now, this is a pretty, uh, looks like a fairly, a fairly esoteric expression. I'll just write it. It's the definition of the normal function. And it is worth knowing it because uh, it's one of those things that looks scary, but actually isn't. Its mathematical form looks scary, but the geometric interpretation is very, very easy. And soon, you guys will become very familiar with this. It's not uh, not at all hard to um, remember after some time. Why is it important to know this particular distribution or this particular function? It turns out that these normal uh, distributions or these uh, Gaussian functions, they are ubiquitous in machine learning. Uh, a lot of machine learning, one way or the other, uses or refers to the normal distribution. So we are encountering it for the very first time. And I'm putting the expression there. And uh, then uh, gradually you'll become familiar with this. Now, I I'll unpack it a little bit for you. Now, what is this? This is the mean, mean or center of the bell curve. So this is the bell curve, right? Bell curve. We've, the normal distribution, its popular name is a bell curve. It's a bell curve of sorts, right? So mean or center of the curve, bell curve. What is sigma? Sigma square is the variance. This is the distribution. This is the sigma squared measure. It, it measures the distribution or a fatness of the bell curve. Is it very, uh, for example, peaked or is it very uh, broad and so forth? Right? Is it a smooth hill? So for example, if I have a distribution like this, this is much more smooth. So it has a bigger sigma square for this sigma square of blue is greater than sigma square of black one and which itself is greater than let's say the sigma square of uh, let's take another color green i'll take do you see that the green is very peaked it's very narrow most of the mass is close to the center this is it so this is it if i have a sigma square for the green and this relationship will follow in this picture is the intuition clear guys 
So sigma square is called the, the variance and it is a measure of the um, how gathered the bell curve is or how spread out it is. So we'll encounter that uh, as we go ahead. And now this term should look pretty familiar to you. What is this term, guys? Do you remember? X minus mu over sigma was what? It is the st scaled or standardized value of X. Scaled or, remember we did this last time, standardized value of X, right? You remember, often represented as Z. Scaled or standard, let, let me write it. Popularly, it's written as Z. And if you remember, the expression for this was Z is by definition X minus mu over sigma. When we were doing the relationship of um, correlation and covariance, you remember we came to this, that Z of X or the standardized representation of X is uh, from the X, you subtract mu. Why? Because you go to the center of gravity of the X data and X minus mu will take you there. And then you bring it to a normal scale divided by sigma so that it begins to look more, uh, uh, the spread is sort of standardized. So this is it. And so if you write it in this expression, this entire thing can be written as this thing actually is a very simple thing. If you write it in uh, X minus mu term, you will realize that it basically says that um, X given mu sigma square is equal to one over two pi sigma square root of two pi e to the uh, e to the minus z square over two, right? And that is also equal to the normal distribution of z with respect to zero sigma square, right? And so this notation at this moment may be a little bit unfamiliar. I'll leave it as such. And uh, you don't have to see a lot of this notation. They look very strange when you come into this field of machine learning, but actually they are not hard. And so uh, experiences uh, as students uh, uh, go through this workshop uh, over time, this all becomes very natural and they start using this notation, but it doesn't come immediately. It takes a little while for us to develop uh, intuition or familiarity with this notation. So I'll leave it as that. And I basically, uh, I will put it at the point at which we say that so long as we are, our line is truly close to this, uh, to the data, we are observing the Gauss Markov assumption. So now comes an interesting result. The initial problem that we posed is, why not this? Why not, for example, why not? So can I ask a question? Uh, one second. Let me finish this thought. Huh? I'll ask this question. So for example, why not r to the power four or sigma i r i cube? So it is a worthwhile question. Uh, why is it that we don't capture error as any one of these terms? You realize that each of these would in some way measure the error and so forth. Why is it that we don't use that? It is something for you to think about. Let me take, Albert, your question. Go ahead. So there is an X there, right? In that N of X. So shouldn't that be, is it? shouldn't that be E or why are you using X instead of EM? I'm just curious. You mean X is here. You mean this expression, yes. isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, no, I'm just defining the normal. And in our particular case, of course, in our case, X is actually epsilon. Okay. It is just the error term. Right? Okay. Uh, I'm just giving a general mathematical expression. It's a bit unfortunate because here we used X for data, but mathematicians often use the word X when they are just dealing with a single variable. So do not, yes, you're right. Do not mix this X with the X of the data itself. Right? Here, our X is epsilon. Right? So what we are saying is that the bulk, the residuals or the epsilons, they have a normal distribution. If you look at all the epsilon values, they have a normal distribution. So that is essentially the Gauss-Markov assumption. 
So under these assumptions, there is actually a theorem which uh, we'll come to, and there's always, uh, so theorems are like milestones, you know, when you're thinking about some topic and you come up with some interesting result, uh, uh, that is not so obvious. People capture it in a theorem. So the theorem is, uh, in particular, let me just write the theorem down. Gauss-Markov theorem. Also called the uh, Gauss-Markov theorem says that the E is equal to R I square is equal to sum over and that is equal to y i minus y i hat squared if you use this and minimize this right, you are much more likely to have a good model so long as the gauss markov assumptions are there so you say that this quadratic terms right is the best linear unbiased estimator which is called blue and uh, so uh, you would say okay so what is the big deal about it it's actually fundamental a lot of example econometric theory uh, wouldn't be valid unless this theorem were true which is why most of the people who do econometrist uh, in their syllabus, in their textbook, very quickly they're introduced to Gauss-Markov theorem and this, the concept of the blue, the best linear unbiased estimator. So from here onwards, I would consider uh, the situation resolved. Now, we won't go into proving this theorem. It's a little bit more uh, intricate, but, uh, but we'll just develop some intuition about it. Why, what does this say? What does this particular estimation of error so e is what it's an error and this expression is some estimator of the error the word people use is the estimator think of it as some way to quantify the error now this is the best why is it the best it is because big terms big error terms are severely penalized what the quadratic term will do so big i'll just write it down big error terms are severely penalized penalized compared to small error terms compared to because of the quadratic you can imagine that if i take a number 1 to 10 one square is one, two square is four, but 10 square is a hundred. Right? So big numbers, they blow up. When you square them, they begin to blow up, isn't it? They have a distribution, let's say um, X and X square. If you, well, let me not use X because X is used for uh, something. Uh, let me use T and T square. If you look at it, the curve will go like this. So what happens uh, for big values of T, the t square is huge, isn't it? It begins to blow up. Quadric, that's what the quadratic term does. And that is good. It helps you create, uh, like by, uh, it, it gives you an estimation of the error such that what do you do? You minimize the next part of it is we minimize the, the error. The error. So whenever we talk of the error, this error, we also call it the loss function. So people often use many things. I use error, the, the loss function, etc. People use all sorts of word, utility function, and there are actually subtle nuances between them. And uh, uh, But for linear regression, they amount to essentially the same thing. But we'll, we'll come to that. But this term, this error term, the sum squared error is what you minimize. Now, how do you minimize it? If you remember, this error term, and this is a recap. So today will be a little bit of a theoretical recap, guys. Huh? So, and we'll, uh, we'll use this recap and gradually move into new territory. This is when you feed it into the model, yi minus 
beta naught minus beta one x square. Now, where did this come from? Well, it turns out that uh, this guy is, this term is, this term is the definition. This is your model, right? So when you expand it out, this term it becomes uh, is equal to, since data is fixed, E is a quadratic function beta 1. So we see this, guys, that it will be a quadratic function. We can expand it out. Um, it will be beta naught square and beta 1, uh, x1 square, and so on and so forth. So because it is of that shape, you know that what it will look like is uh, a surface if you now let's look at this uh, then this is your beta naught beta one and this is your error beta naught beta one now by error we always mean the sum squared error right sum squared error so uh, this is the the word people often use is sum let me just write it here sum squared error, right, is the thing. Now we minimize this. We have to minimize this. Now, how does this error surface look like? If you remember, I mentioned that this error surface looks like this. It's a quadratic surface, a quadratic surface that is like a bowl. And this achieves a minima, if I come down, it achieves a minima somewhere here in the ground, right? So there is some preferred place, beta naught, beta one. Uh, the solution, this is the best, best location in the hypothesis space or the parameter space, hypothesis space or parameter space where the error surface, where the, well, I went up too much, where the, where the, achieves its minima. So this will map to some value E minimum, minimum, isn't it? At this particular value of this, this is the minimum value that it will achieve. Now the whole question is, how do we reach that? How do we discover that? Right? Now, the way the intuition for that is, suppose we have the data, let's project the data back here. We have the data and let's bring in our data again. I won't put too many points here, but uh, something like this. And so we can draw arbitrary many lines, right? We can draw a line that goes like this. We can draw another line that goes like this. Right? And then we can draw a third line, let us say the red line, which is that goes through, like, sorry, maybe the best line, right? Let me make it the best line by adding a few more points here and there. Okay, so suppose this is your best line. How do you go, how do you find this? The question is, how do you find this? Um, That's the crux of the problem, isn't it? It is not enough to be able to pick a hypothesis, pick a line, to, uh, which is a hypothesis of a relationship between x and y, x and y, uh, sorry, x and y, but you have to find the best line. 
And how do we do that? Each line, which we assume is a relationship between input and output, is a hypothesis. And each line corresponds to a real point. Actually, this point, let me just mark it as uh, the real the points here. Points. And let us say that this green point uh, corresponds to this this line the green line corresponds to this point and let us say that the blue line corresponds to uh, some other point here uh, let me just take it as let me just take this as a, a blue is uh, yeah let us say blue point in the hypothesis space huh? so in the hypothesis plane, these are three different points, and in data space, they are lines. The question is, we can arbitrarily pick a point, but we need a way to get to the real answer. In other words, it's okay to make a mistake, to pick a wrong line, a wrong hypothesis. We just need a way to find the right one. And the example that I gave is, we need to do so-called gradient descent. We need to somehow tumble down from here to here. Here, are we together? So we talked about, and this is where we ended the last lecture. We said that we need gradient descent. Descent, gradient descent to the best point. So so far, guys, I hope it is obvious that if we gradient descent from any arbitrary uh, hypothesis it will take us to the best hypothesis, right? And when you do that, you achieve the two goals or the two legs on which machine learning works. You first quantify the error and then you minimize that, you improve upon it. So you can't improve upon it anymore and you are left with the irreducible error. That's about it, right? So what is gradient descent? I will illustrate the concept of gradient descent using a very simple function. So let's take a function, fx. And this is a function, fx. Y is some function of x. And I've just made a curve here for illustration, to illustrate the point. So let's take two points. I will take a point and take a green point, let us say is here. So uh, suppose you take a point here. Look, observe, let me just call this point A and its value here, A prime, right, on the curve as A prime. Now I will take another point, let us say B. B along the x-axis, right? And by the way, I use x, but actually it's because people are used to using x in uh, mathematics, but let's stay with the notation. Now I will bring about a very simple concept. At this point, what is the slope? What is the tangent? Is the slope positive or negative? So uh, let us define slope. Slope is, Slope is defined as increase per unit increase of x. Actually, this is a bit sloppy because uh, you know a unit may be a huge. So just assume that uh, your unit is very very small. It's a millimeter or something like that. But how much do you rise in y as an increase? Defined as increase per unit, actually. Uh, increase of what? Increase of fx per unit. Increase of x. And the underlying assumption is, uh, in calculus, you make the assumption that you, uh, hopefully your unit is infinitesimally small. Hopefully, your unit is very small. 
Why is that? Because the value changes. You notice that the slope changes at different places on this curve. So if you take a very small unit and then ask how much did uh, fx change, that is the slope. So look here, if you move in the positive x direction, let me say positive x direction, let's say delta x, did fx increase or decrease? Anyone like to tell me this value, which is fx, it is greater than fx, isn't it? This relationship is true. So you say that the slope is positive. In other words, slope at b is positive. Now, what about slope at x? At this one point, the, the tangent to this line is like this. So what happens is, when I go make a unit increase, by the way, this is unit increase delta x. When I make a unit increase, when I go in up to delta x, what does it mean here? This, this is fx plus delta x, isn't it? So is fx here, is it more, and this is fx, is fx plus delta x more or less than fx? Less. It's yeah. less. So uh, would it be fair, therefore, to say, uh, I'll write it down, is less than fx. So therefore, we can say slope at a is negative. Would you agree with this so far? Now, what do we want to do? We are looking for the best spot. We need to go here. This is our best answer, right? Answer, let me just call this uh, C. We, our goal is one way or another, from every point, goal. From every point, from any, and therefore, every point, point, point of the curve, point, we need a way to reach C quickly. This is our goal, right? Because wh why is C, why are we in pursuit of C? Because at C, the function achieves a minima, and we are searching for a minima of the function. So suppose this is your goal, and you are at A. Let's look at A. You make a change delta x. Wh which direction do you want to go into? You will say that, uh, the next, should you go in the positive direction or should you go in the negative direction? From A, if I want to minimize, let's look at the picture again. Uh, sorry, this is good. If I'm st staying at A, should I move in the positive direction to decrease the function or should I move in the negative direction? Negative. negative. No, no, I want to negative. decrease the function, make positive. it positive. You realize that if I move this, this function, from here it comes down to fx plus delta x and then fx plus delta x is smaller, right? So for example, this is fx plus delta x, isn't it? It's smaller than fx. So I will write the rule down as this, at a, a move in the positive direction, move a bit in the positive direction. Right. So we can say that the delta x, the step that we take, should be, uh, now you realize that, the, suppose I write it like this, it is some small step in the positive direction, but how do we know which is the positive direction given x at that particular point? Uh, so suppose we do this, 
uh, I will use the word uh, DFDX. Right? Uh, it, it is the derivative, but it is actually the slope. Uh, let me uh, geometrically, this is the slope at delta x at a. Let me just put it this way fx dfx dx at a, right? Uh, this is the slope at a, right? So suppose I take this step such that x, the next step of x, let me call it x tilde, is the previous value of x, right? And now you notice that this is negative, right? At a, this quantity is negative, the slope is negative. Let's say that alpha is a small step. Uh, let's say alpha is equal to 0 0.01, a small step. And then this quantity is negative. So how do I move in the forward direction? Would you agree that this quantity, if I make it a negative thing here, then this criteria will be fulfilled. I would have a delta x would be in the positive direction. Does this make sense, guys? Because my derivative at a is negative, slope is negative, I multiply it by a negative number and it becomes positive. Right? So therefore, I can say that my next position of at x, next position at a, is the previous position at a minus alpha df dx. Uh, at this point, guys, if you don't quite understand, uh, it's okay, uh, but uh, we will write it as a fact. Are you guys getting the intuition? You need to go against the slope, the value of the slope. If you go against the value of the slope, because the slope is negative, you'll end up moving in the positive direction. Are we together, guys? Any questions? Anybody who did not understand that? Now, at uh, C, at this point, uh, B, the, a similar consideration applies. Uh, So the same thing applies. Now look at B. You want to take a step in which direction? Backwards direction, isn't it? To reach C from B, which way do you want to move, forward or backward? It is clear that we need to move backwards, right? Because we are trying to get to C. So here we can say that delta x at B should be, actually this is too fat, uh, delta at x, B should be equal to, uh, well, the slope is positive. So alpha small step, and if I multiply it by the slope at B, this is positive, this is positive. Well, that would be bad because it would take us in the forward direction, away from C. Once again, I need to put a negative quantity there. Do we see that, guys? Huh? That in both the cases, if I want to go towards the center, I need to go against the slope. As simple as that. And therefore, it doesn't matter whether I'm on this side or this side, you have the more universal formula, which is the which is the famous formula of gradient descent. It is this. Gradient descent formula is says gradient descent, therefore, and it's a result. Gradient descent is this formula. Delta x is always minus alpha df dx, right? Or uh, put another way, x tilde is equal to the previous value. The, this is the future value, the next value of x. x of x, oh, sorry, this doesn't look nice. Next value of x is the previous value minus alpha df dx. Now, why this derivative? This derivative is actually, it is sort of a, a throttle. Think about this way. What happens when we come very close to this? What is the slope here? Close to zero, isn't it? And this is zero. Do you see that? When we achieve the minima, what is the slope at the minima? There is no slope, it's flat. Do you see that, guys, that at C, the slope is, uh, sorry, where is my color thing gone? Draw this. The slope is flat. 
So df dx will, will be zero at this point. Df c dx is equal to zero. Well, this is rather scribblish. Let me be better here. Yeah. At this point, df dx is equal to zero at a. So far, so good, guys. And so this is a way for us to throttle down and not keep moving forward. So one of the questions you could ask is that uh, I could have just taken the sign of uh, the derivative, right, positive or negative. Uh, why do I keep the quantity itself? The, the reason you keep the quantity is if you don't keep the quantity, you'll never be able to stop. You'll forever keep making uh, progress. You'll overshoot and so forth. So by putting the derivative there, you know when to stop. You stop when the derivative vanishes. A more practical terms, what you do is uh, the derivative will never quite absolutely go to zero because there'll be noise or something in the data. But uh, in, in a more general sense, for linear regression, it does go to zero very easily. But in more complicated uh, algorithms, uh, you just, in practical terms, come close to zero and you say we are done. Right? We are very close to the real thing. So this is how you find the minima of a function. Now let's take that uh, knowledge and apply it to the same thing in our, where is the mouse going? Oh. Uh, give me uh, guys for one minute. I seem to have. Uh, one second. Reach down, huh? Yeah. So, no, I don't want to go down too much. All right. I'll just write here and I need to uh, charge my mouse. It's a good point for us to take a segue, a little break. So, um, um, where were we? So, this is gradient descent. Using gradient descent, we can come to the minimum. So guys, if the calculus is not very obvious, um, it's all right. These things come and become very uh, easy to understand after you have listened to it and thought over it many, many times. So in our case, you know, our hypothesis space is this, beta naught, beta one, and this is the error function in terms of beta naught, beta one. So how do we bring in this whole concept of gradient descent out here. So the way we do that is, uh, hang on, hang on. Uh, all right. The way we do that is this thing just gets modified. We we are walking in the hypothesis space. So it is very much like walking in our simple function space. We say beta naught, the next value is equal to the previous value of beta naught minus alpha and partial derivative of e with respect to beta naught. So in other words, uh, when you do multiple variables, you want the slope, right? Slopes are partial derivatives with respect to a single variable. You look at a cross section of the surface, there's a good geometric interpretation to it. And the same thing we can do for this beta one, right? So this is the rule, this is the gradient descent rule to find the solution. It can also be written in a much more formal vector notation. You can say that beta's next value of beta in, uh, is, if you look at it, beta next, let me just put it, is beta, the initial value of the plant that we need to, one squared error, works very well. when the line assumptions are met, line conditions are met, or the Gauss-Markov assumptions are met. Simple terms. Number two, gradient descent is an efficient means to find the path 
the best hypothesis or model. Are we together, guys? So this is essentially, uh, if you understand these two concepts, you have understood not just linear regression, but actually a whole class of machine learning predictive models. This is what it all is based on. And so at this particular moment, before I move forward, uh, I would like to take questions. Uh, are there any questions, guys? So Asif, can you go back to the uh, screen where uh, you did those epsilon and stuff like that? And I was just, okay. I, I kind of lost you on yeah, that. And, what uh, is that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I should go back. Actually, I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty. My mouse has run out of power. Hang on. So I'm trying to find uh, where you're talking about. Uh, epsilon. Yes, then, and yes. Yeah, this is it. Oops. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, here we go. So ask you, what is this uh, giving you in terms of this is this is the error distribution, correct? Yeah, basic idea is it's an assumption. If your residual terms are not normally distributed, right, around zero, then you cannot use linear, uh, you cannot use your sum squared error the way you have written for your model. It won't work. So in a way, I gave you an introduction to the bell curve. Bell curve is something you may or may not have encountered in your engineering or your undergraduate studies. At some point, you probably have encountered, but uh, you probably didn't realize how central it is to machine learning. So early on in this workshop series, I thought today I will introduce you to the bell curve. And we had to encounter it anyway. Uh, today is a good day to encounter it. So basically... Okay, so basically for non-linear data, this is the way to do it. And for everything else, you can use the sum square, I mean the least square or the gradient. No, 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 the way did non-linear come in? No, this is the linear assumption. The, lean, the Gauss Markov assumption says that if your data is like this, then, and the blue line, can be a good hypothesis. Now, if you look at this, what are the things about the blue line you can tell? By looking at the orange dots, you can tell that the data looks linear, isn't it? It truly is linear. The second thing you can tell is that the residues are rather small and most big residues are uncommon. Small residues are common. So these resi residuals, sorry, not residues, I keep saying residues, residuals, but the residuals and uh, or the error terms, they will actually form a bell curve distribution. If you plot them as a histogram, you will notice uh, as a frequency chart, you'll notice that they have a bell curve distribution. Okay. So we are still within the world of the linear. Okay. Are we together? But if you have non-linear data, then you cannot use a linear model, obviously. So for example, look at this case. You cannot use linear model. It breaks the Gauss Markov assumption for you. Clearly here, right? Data itself is non-linear. So here, um, the error, we said that it's a sum of a residue. Um, I'm, sum of square of residues, sum squared residues. Yeah, but we, residuals, yeah. Hmm. why did we make it a square? I, mean, I understand that it is easy to, for us to make it, but will the error be not of a different quantity than just the sum of errors? Yeah, so the idea is that, see, uh, you can do the sum of errors. You can't take the raw sum of errors because that would be a negative, I mean, positive and negative will so cancel each other out. So you have to take the size of the error. Now you can just take the size of the error, uh, like here, like this particular thing. It is just not very common for a reason that uh, I explained. So you can take this, you can take this, you can take the fourth power, third power, you can do anything. So long as you're adding up the residuals, you can take any power of the size of residuals. So the question that comes is, which is the best one to take? 
And so that's where an important theorem comes in, discovered by Gauss and Markov. It's called the Gauss-Markov theorem. It says that under sensible assumptions, those sensible assumptions being Gauss-Markov assumptions, means your data, actually your line actually seems to go through the data and the data is linear, then it is best to take the error term to be the sum of square of residuals. It's a mathematical result. It's a theorem. Okay. And just one general question. In the first one, when we draw the black box to represent the hypothesis, we said uh, the input is an X vector. See, what happens is mathematicians always look at a tuple, you know, a collection of X1, X2, X3. Uh, it, it follows the natural notion of a vector. In other words, it follows the properties of a vector space. What it means is, and it's a bit of a geometric intuition. You say that um, regression models, they map to each point, each vector X of value Y. Right? So uh, they are basically a uh, Y hat is basically some function of X vector. That is the mathematical, uh, mathematically concise way of saying it. So the vector usage is deliberate. In practical terms, uh, if you don't think in terms of vectors, it doesn't hurt you. Like most computer scientists, what do they think of it as a list of features, you know, a temperature, you know, this or that, temperature, humidity, a day of the week, and so on and so forth. So if you just think of it as a, a pressure, wind, rain, if you just think of it as a list of values, so long as you know that in data, the first one is the temperature, the second is pressure, wind, et cetera, et cetera. And programming, you'll make it an array, typically a size here four or a list or something like that. It's perfectly fine, right? Uh, but more formally, it's a vector. Okay, thank you. So, Guys, uh, any questions? But otherwise, we'll take a very small uh, break and I will then introduce the concept of uh, uh, like, so this is sort of the background. I'll use this background to go and explain uh, concepts of how do you, uh, at the end of it, know that you have a good model? What are your model diagnostics? What is bias, variance, trade-off? What are regressions? I have a so, quick question, if you don't mind. No, of okay. course not. Yeah, is there ahead. something I can't help you with? No, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, um, can you uh, explain again why we use uh, partial derivatives instead of uh, normal derivatives and while doing gradient descent? See, because in multi uh, multivariate, uh, your error surface is made up of beta naught and beta one, right? right? So think of it. So you don't have a concept when you have a multivariate function, you don't have a concept of a, um, of a derivative. Derivative concept is only for single variable. Oh, okay, got it. So the concept generalized to multiple variables is partial derivative. So I'll give you the intuition of it. So suppose you are in a hill and you ask yourself, if I go north, how much altitude I'll gain or lose? So for you to measure, you don't want to also change, go east, west at the same time. You want to only go north, south, a little bit north right? and see, did you gain altitude or lose altitude, isn't it? So there will be a slope along the north-south direction and then another slope along the east-west direction. And the only way you can find that is when you're going north, you'll keep your position along the east-west axis the same. Right? You'll hold the other axis fixed, value along the other axis fixed, and just make a change along the north-south axis. Right? Yeah. This is what you would do when you're hiking. And that is exactly the concept that partial derivative says, keeping other variables the same, if I make a unit step in this direction, how much will the value change? Okay. Okay. Got it. Thanks. So guys, I'll, uh, we have been talking now for about an hour or so. Today is going to be a little longish session because I also want to do some coverage of the labs and I have a new set of notes to release to you, uh, lab notes to release. But uh, any more questions before we go into the break? Uh, Asif, actually, there's a very similar question to the previous one. Uh, the partial derivatives beta naught and beta one, you are descending on each of them uh, partially. Yes, yes. Uh, they are independently uh, descending. 
so the yes. minima achieved through that dis- uh, descending through beta 1 and the beta 0 uh, yeah. uh, can you say both of the minimas will coincide to be the same i am just a little yes yes of course of course so let me tell you see what happens is uh, let me make the intuition clear with a picture this deserves a picture here this is beta not let's make it really big this is the error beta not beta 1 right we have the error surface and these lines are there these are contour lines right um yes these are contour lines let's do one thing uh, let's project it down oh, sorry not these are what are contour lines lines which are at the same height you know in geology you use the term contour height so for example all the points along this curve they are at the same height isn't it this is a contour on the hill so now let us look at this what happens is that if you look at this actually i can color it differently let me use different colors to illustrate this point let me use a blue for this then let me use green for uh, sorry this one let me and let me use something else red for this and uh, i don't know I, i may soon run out of colors this this and let me go get another one what color can we pick that we didn't pick let's pick uh, more colors let's pick some this color so suppose this color okay black is good enough so if you see these things projected onto the beta not beta 1 you know you think of beta not beta 1 as the floor you know the surface at the bottom so what will they look like they will look like this the red line will project down to this the shadow of the of the red contour will be here the shadow of the blue contour will be another line if you look at it here and the shadow of the green line would be yeah and the shadow of the orange line would be yeah isn't it and something very interesting in geometric is there i didn't sort of bring that to you uh, you guys attention here so suppose you take an arbitrary point in the hypothesis space suppose you start here right now associated and and maybe even worse than that let's stay okay let me bring that line again back uh, yeah and there was a black one also there now i need a color to show my journey what color can i pick um let me use a violet color i have not used violet so far okay so suppose i start here right initially my hypothesis i just pick a random hypothesis a random line what do you want you want to go straight in right so you want to go this direction yeah that's fine and this journey is the direction of gradient descent it's literally the if you look at this uh, do you realize that this is the journey because you are going from here to here to here to here to here to the best point literally that you can see it you see that right and this journey is the journey of literally the gradient descent from the top to the bottom is a journey on the hypothesis plane it is the shortest route back home yeah and that is the intuition of gradient descent i see so you do the beta beta 1 parallelly like uh, yes you do it both together uh, not... so what you do is one step let me yeah very good question one step one step so when you write a code imagine that you have a code right your your code will literally <laughs> run like that for uh, uh for int 
I is if you're writing something like C or C++, right? I'm just going to give you the mm -hmm. syntax. I less than, let's say that you're willing to make, uh, I'll take an example, a thousand, thousand iterations, right? I plus plus. Yeah. What will you do? You will just say beta, the new value of beta naught is equal to, so initially you'll start with some arbitrary values, initialize with, with yeah, random, some random values, right? Yeah, beta naught, beta one. And then all you do is you will literally write code that says, take the, take this minus alpha d a uh -huh. d a, beta naught, or beta one. And in the same step, you update both of them together. Uh -huh. Beta one is minus d a d a beta one. Right? It's good that you ask this question because this makes, uh, this makes for uh, actually, uh, Hang on, let me one circle step. with a different color. One step, exactly. Uh, and thanks for asking this question, actually. I should say, this is one step. Uh, where should I put it? This is actually one step, right? You see that in the for loop. You'll, you, and uh, the for, th for thousand steps. So people use the word iterations or steps or, or things like that. And you will be smarter than that because what will happen is how do you know that thousand steps are enough, right? And uh, or it is too much. So at some point, what will happen is once you notice that you, your uh, change is not too much, neither beta naught nor beta one seems to be changing too much. You'll just break out of the loop, right? You say I'm done. I found the minima. So you do some smartness, but roughly speaking, this is the code for you. Are we together, guys, so far? Any other questions? If there are no other questions, we'll take a 10, 15 minute break. Yeah, so guys, we have a somewhat longish theory session. Are you all game for it today? I'd like to finish linear regression and bias variance trade-offs. Uh, yes. yes. Yes, sir. Yes. All right, guys, so I'm going to pause the recording and uh, let's go and take um, okay. It's being recorded again. So, see, data can present to you in many forms. Suppose the data is like this. This is clearly what we will call linear data, isn't it? The moment you see this, your basic intuition says, I need to just draw a line like this. So case one, uh, case A. What if you get data, let us say, case B. Suppose you get data that looks like, actually I used another form for data. So suppose data looks like this. the data that we talked about. Uh, is this linear data? Can we model it with a line? No. We cannot model it with a line, right? So the question is, linear regression, when we think of a model, which is uh, like this, a linear regression model, we wrote it as uh, y hat is equal to beta naught plus beta one x. This wouldn't capture this situation. So what can we do to capture this situation? Right? Uh, this curve is very obviously, it's a quadratic curve, isn't it? And so we can easily say that, suppose we were to add a term, beta two, x square. Now you realize that this has become a quadratic equation. Now, let me remind you of something interesting about curves and polynomials. A straight line has zero bend. It is, uh, what is the highest power of x? Polyn polynomial of x. What, it is the first degree polynomial of x, isn't it? Do you see that, guys? Eh? 
the x in terms of x is a linear polynomial. What about this? You write this as a quadratic expression, isn't it? y is proportional to x squared. Right? The highest polynomial term would be quadratic, isn't it? So the polynomial term would be 2. The highest polynomial term would be 2. Right? You would write it as y is beta naught plus beta 1 x plus beta 2 x squared. And we can generalize from that. We can say, suppose you have three bands, something like this. So each band requires an extra turn. So how many degrees do we need here? So bends is three, bends one. A line by definition bends are zero, right? So this would need y is equal to beta naught plus beta one x plus beta two x squared plus beta three x cube. If it would need a equation of the third degree because we have two bends number of bends is two actually, uh, this is three. Do you see this uh, connection guys? So suppose I make a curve with three bends, can you tell me what degree of polynomial I would need? Anyone can guess that? Can you extrapolate from this? Four, Four right? So if bends is equal to three, poly degree will be four. And so you see the relationship. So one of the thoughts that people had is, suppose you're given data, you're given a data like this, literally like this. Then just by visualizing the data, especially if it is a one dimensional data, you could essentially infer what degree of polynomial would be good isn't it? And so you can, in general, write it, uh, let's say that this one is y is equal to beta naught plus beta 1 x plus beta 2 x square plus beta 3 x cube, right? Something like that. <coughs> and you can look at the data and get some sense what equation you would write. These are called polynomial. The, people often use the word polynomial regression. It sort of generalizes in a single dimension the straight line to uh, admit for the fact that your thing may be, uh, your model may be like this. This is your model, and uh, this is your model. Right? So we talk about polynomial regression. Now, given data, how would you know what degree of polynomial to take? Polynomials are good. You can say y is equal to beta naught plus beta 1x plus a beta 2x squared plus a beta 3x cubed. And you can keep going on to the nth degree polynomial, xn. Right. So it raises two questions, two questions. And we'll limit ourselves to one dimension now because from one dimension, it generalizes to higher dimension. Uh, if you take, can every data be represented as a uh, Polynomial relationship. Yeah. Right. That is question number one. Question number two is, which degree of polynomial to pick? Now, I'd like to say something about, uh, before we answer these two questions, I'd like to say a word about polynomial regression. Uh, this may seem paradoxical to you now, 
uh, but uh, mathematically polynomial regression is also a linear regression it is just linear in a uh, sort of more terms polynomial terms or people would say in a polynomial vector space the equation is still a linear equation now why is it linear because it is additive and i won't go more into it it's a mathematical aside uh, let me just put it in the page as a mysterious statement that gradually as we develop more mathematical sophistication uh, we will um, understand what it means polynomial regression is also a form of despite what people say it is also a form of linear regression uh, mathematical sense as we will see later later so it is just an aside how is it linear it doesn't look linear a quadratic equation and a linear equation are entirely different according to the common language uh, but we'll get into it when we understand the concept of vector spaces and that won't be uh, for another till you get to the second workshop the more intermediate workshop where we'll do actually not even then if you take the, the math behind data science i cover it there but for now i'll leave that statement there and now we will come back to two questions this question and this question can every data be represented as a polynomial relationship and the answer to that is quite interesting when people uh, came up with linear regression and we are talking of 1805 legendre's paper on least square and Gauss's paper in 1793 on the uh, on very elliptically referred to it uh, then people started doing linear regression it's a very powerful tool and then they encountered curves they found data not all data is actually straight but the question therefore arose can we model it and people said yeah why not let's count the number of bends i mean there is a polynomial and we can model it with a polynomial there still remains a question which degree of polynomial to pick where should you stop should you stop at the second degree the third degree the fourth degree the fifth degree where exactly should you stop and that question will come to later but let's ask a more fundamental question can every function because a relationship in the data between target and input is a function uh, some hypothesis function um, can every data be represented as a polynomial relationship so uh, i want people who are uh, new of course uh, to answer this people who have been in my math class obviously shouldn't answer this on my prior class i would like to get some guesses does this seem logical that you know you just count the number of bends in a line and you'll get a poly and you can basically write a polynomial that can fit to that curve in the data what would you say guys any thoughts any ideas my initial guess is yes but it depends on how we define a bend right how we define the bend that is one answer okay uh, anybody else would like to take a shot at it i don't uh, by the way the full uh, nuance will escape you at this moment it's all right you're getting back to the mathematical space a little bit so uh, it may not come to you anybody else would like to take a stab at this well, I, I don't think so all the data can be uh, Fitted into polynomials. Uh, if it's uh, distributed as clusters, so uh, no. Let's think in just two dimensions, x and y. I, I think as long as it's continuous, I think we can express in a polynomial relationship. Yeah. Assume continuity. Assume that you have continuous distribution. Then the curve is continuous. Yes. Then I think yes. <coughs> yeah, oh. that's a good thought. D yeah. Does it? have to be a function sir what if it's like circular a circle is not a function in the traditional sense 
Uh, I mean, it is a it is a quadratic yeah. function. We can write it differently, z, but it is not a really a function. It's a constraint. X square plus y square is equal to one. You realize that it uh, admits. So let's take the question of a circle uh, as a aside. Circle is more what you would call a constraint because you write it as x square plus y square. Let us say equal to one, which means that y is equal to plus minus. 1 minus x square, right? So the plus minus makes it a dual value. For a given value of x, there are two values of y. Right? Whereas we want one value of y, not two. So imagine that it, it is, there are no tricks to it, two values. So I'll leave that aside. The question is very interesting, actually. People initially got very uh, optimistic way back, and they thought, yes, let us try to model a lot of data with it. But then it turned out that uh, there, is a, there is a class of functions. Their name is quite literally transcendental functions. Let me write it with a big new color because it merits a different, uh, merits something. Oh, I've raised the maximum of this. Okay, yeah, this is good. Uh, transcendental function. Transcendental function. It turns out that you guys are familiar with this, uh, with the transcendentals. Some of the early transcendentals or simpler transcendentals you have encountered in your studies in high school. Uh, so what are transcendentals? These are things, these are functions, which cannot be represented as a polynomial of finite degree. So the word is cannot be represented, and it's very interesting, you should know this, cannot be represented as polynomials of finite degree. So if you try to represent it as a polynomial expansion, there will be infinitely many terms. Example, sine x, cosine x, etc. So for example, if you remember, uh, do you guys remember the trigonometric relationship sine x, cosine x? Will do right trigonometric relationships. Okay, uh, it just happened. Uh, give me a moment. The screen is uh, one step closer. I think so. When you try to expand a sine x, sine x, for example, anybody remembers a Taylor expansion of this is x minus x cube over. 3 factorial plus x5 over 5 factorial minus x7 over 7 factorial right? plus x9 over 9 factorial. And it goes on till infinity. Right? Infinite many terms. It never stops. And if you think about why it doesn't stop, because a sine wave is like this. So how many bends does a sine wave have? Well, it literally has infinitely I many bends, it. isn't it? Yes. So infinitely many bends. And so it's an example of something that is that cannot be represented as a polynomial of a finite degree. So you can't write a regression equation because you can't do regression in a <laughs> model that has infinitely many terms in programming, you can't deal with it. So cosine x is also like that. And then this bell curve, are another example, the bell curve that you encountered, the bell curve uh, given sigma, uh, sigma square mu, Remember the bell curve expression. It is an exponential equation. And when you expand it out, any e to the power x also expands to infinitely many terms. 
So this is a realization that you cannot model a transcendental function with a finite degree polynomial. And if you do that, you will encounter something that we'll see in our next lab called the Runge phenomenon. When we, and I'll write this warning down, when you try to model a transcendental function related data, in other words, a data whose underlying mechanism is a transcendental function, it's a data with a polynomial. And if this thing looks mysterious, it will all become very obvious when we do the lab. Polynomial function of finite degree, we get a range phenomenon In the data, what is the range phenomenon? What happens is it is it is something I'll leave as a mystery till we encounter it. I also call it the wagging tails. And this is my word. It's not sort of something you find in books, but more intuitively, your uh, model develops a wagging tail. And we'll see what it means. But so that answers the first question, I hope. Right? The second question that remains is, which degree of polynomial to pick? Right? We will now answer that question because therein I would like to introduce, use that to introduce the, the so-called bias variance trade-off. So I'll write the question down all, again. Once again, which degree of polynomial? Which degree um, of polynomial? to pick, right? So you realize that the more call, uh, more generally, the higher the degree of the polynomial, the more the bends, the higher the degree, degree, and the more complex the model. Model or hypothesis. more bends, isn't it? So the question is, how do you do that? One easy answer one can give is, just go visualize the data and try to infer how many bends are there. Now, two things may happen. <clears throat> Either the data is being produced by a ground truth, which is represented by a transcendental function. So in that case, you're lost. But on the other hand, if it is not, if it can be approximated with a degree polynomial and even transcendental functions can sometimes be approximated with a finite degree polynomial within a certain interval. So uh, then the question remains, how many degrees do we take? So what happens is the more complex model you take, the more easily it will adapt to the data. A straight line has no bends. So if your data is uh, is quadratic, you will be lost. Let me explain this with a with this idea. Suppose you have data like this. Let's go back and take this, this data. The other data I'll take is this. And the third data I'll take is like this. Let me take this data set like this. Now, suppose you make a hypothesis because in one dimension you can still see the data, but assume in higher dimensions you won't be able to see the data. So you wouldn't be able to very easily get a sense of how many bends are there and so forth. Yeah. Imagine that you're flying blind and you can't see the shape of the curves or the surfaces, the, the relationships. Suppose you insist that a linear model is what you will take. You realize that from this, there is no good linear model you can draw. This is linear, and here, sorry, if you try to do the best linear model you'll probably get is something like this. The best degree one 
model. Degree one polynomial is line. The best fit line that you can get, best fit line, best fit line. You can clearly see that uh, in case A, it works. In, uh, sorry, it doesn't work. In, it doesn't work at all. In case B, it works perfectly. Case C also, it doesn't work very well. Isn't it, guys? So on the other hand, suppose you take a green model, which is always a, a three degree polynomial, third degree polynomial. Now, how would you fit two bends in this data? You realize that something like this, one, two, three, the green line. So what can you tell about the green line versus the uh, purple line? The, the purple line is simpler. The green line is more complex. Right? Here also, suppose you do this. But here, two degrees. Actually, I should have made two degrees. So let me mark it like this. Um, something like this. Um, so is this better? Or if we take a second degree model, let me take a model that is like uh, this, which always is parabolic. One, here it would be parabolic, and here it would be like this. So between the this model, the green model, and the purple model, you realize uh, where is the red model the best? It is best for? A. Best for A. And the green model is best for? C. Uh, C. For C. And the purple model is best for? B. Right? So you can make different hypotheses, polynomials of different degrees, and you ultimately don't know, uh, flying blind, when you come encounter a data, which model is best. So let us try to understand the difference between the models. A is the, see, uh, the purple is the simplest model. This is the simplest, right? Simplest is purple, purple, then next is, next is green, green is parabolic, and the purple is the complex. So as you increase the degree of, uh, the oh, sorry, what just happened? The red, red is parabolic and the uh, green is complex. Yes, hang on guys, eh? something strange happened. The red is, oh, I, I apologize, red was parabolic and the green was third degree. I, I missed that one. Eh? Uh, let me interchange these two. Red, red is, this should be red. And uh, green. Uh, thanks for correcting me. Uh, and this would have been a disaster otherwise. Here we go. Something like this. So what happens is, if you look at the degree of the polynomial, n is equal to one, n is equal to two, n is equal to three, right? For any given situation, a model can be just right. Let's look at B. A model can be just right. Let's say the straight line is just right. Simplest model just works. But if you look at A and C, you realize that the simplest model, the purple model doesn't work, isn't it? It is too simple. It doesn't capture the complexity of the data. Would you agree with that? It has no flexibility. Are we together, guys? Yes. So then we use certain words. We say that simpler model, like for A, when a model 
is simpler than the ground truth. The ground truth you don't know. Some, some uh, ground truth function has produced the data. But when the model that you build is simpler than the ground truth, you will have a you will have errors like this see these errors are the errors of huge amount of errors right huge amount of errors these are all errors then this 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 these errors have errors in purple the, these errors are called called bias errors are we together on the other hand when your model is more complex than the ground truth, you will have errors that are called variance errors. More of, you'll have more errors uh, most of your errors will be bias errors if you're uh, if you have a model that is simpler than reality and if you have a model more complex than reality you'll have high high variance errors huh? so uh, let me uh, show that for a straight line look at the green one the green completely misses the boat isn't it it is filled with See how widely the green gets wrong for the case of B, isn't it? But green does perfectly well for C. Right? Uh, should I repeat this concept? Are we getting it? That given the underlying truth, whenever you make a model or a polynomial, it can be just about right, or it could be simpler than reality, or it could be more complex. So, for example, in situation A, which is the best model is A. Right? For A, is the red model. For B, it is the purple model, which is really the simplest model. And for C, it is the more complex model, the green one, that is perfect. Right? So, for C, if you take a straight line, what sort of errors do you get? Bias errors, right? Here also, yeah. you get high bias errors. These are high bias errors. Lot, you can literally see how many bias errors that you're getting. These terms, will they, they actually add up to a whole bias errors. So then, things like that. So it brings up this question that how do you determine which is the best model to, which is the best hypothesis to take? And that is a bit of a challenge. There is no uh, out-of-the-box mathematical way that will help you into it that this is the right uh, polynomial if a polynomial fits the data at all and so there is an expression actually you say that the error that you get the total error that you get from a hypothesis is the total error is made up of the bias error term actually bias is a mathematical expression so i'll just square it a bias error term plus variance error variance right and plus there is some irreducible error which i will leave irreducible we talked about irreducible before so bias plus variance total error that you have in a model is bias plus variance even when you have learned done gradient descent have the best uh, fit still based on your hypothesis it will have a bias. So when your reality is simpler than your model, you'll end up with high variance errors. When the reality is more complex than your model, you will have a bias errors. Right? 
So this is called the bias variance trade-off. Usually what happens is, as you dial up the complexity, suppose, let, let's look at this reality, the, the quadratic reality. So you go from linear, linear is bad, you have high bias error. What about variance errors? You won't have much variance errors. But as you dial it up to the second degree, you, you quadratic, you're perfect. But beyond quadratic, when you go, you start having not bias, but variance errors. So if you look at the error term, there is a bias variance trade-off. Right. And the way to find this or to discover this bias variance trade-off and find and pick a model of the right size is quite an art. Uh, there is a process to it, and we'll learn the process. See, what you do is you take a polynomial. Let's say you take a polynomial of degree 3. You try to fit it to the data. It may either it may fit the data very well, right? But when you try it out on test data, new data, it will give you ridiculous results. Like for example, this green line for uh, for the green line for the straight B in this situation, the green line is absurd. Yet when you train a polynomial uh, model, a third degree model, or a fourth or fifth degree model to the data it sort of adapts to the data. It somehow goes and overfits to the data. Right? So we, I'll write it down. Model may, complex model, let me write that statement down. It's a warning. Complex models tend to overfit the data. Fit the data. I'd illustrate it with an example. It's very easy actually to see it. Suppose I give you three points, or maybe four points. Uh, what is a model? You could make a, you could just say maybe a straight line, something like this, isn't it? This looks reasonable, but if you take a quadratic model, you may, you can actually try to fit uh, fit it better. You can do something like, uh, I don't know, something like this. Uh, you notice that here the error terms are much less because it has sort of adapted to this data. You can take a third degree term and it would be even more um, interesting. A third degree term can be like this. You notice that by the time you go to a third degree term, you pretty much have a perfect match. In fact, you will if you have four data points. You do uh, equation in fourth degree, it will get to a perfect match. This complex model has just adapted to the data. So when you look at the error term, it will actually be zero. Error of the third degree will be zero. It, has, it is flexible enough to go through all the points. A straight line won't be able to go through all the points because the points are not uh, collinear. Quadratic will have a bit of a difficulty. Right? You can see that there is no quadratic uh, thing that will go through all of them. But a third degree term will nicely go through all the points. The question is, is that a good model? Something tells you that that's not a good model. Right? The straight line is too simple, perhaps, or maybe it is okay. You don't know. So how do we build good models? Because ultimately, a model should be able to make good predictions on new data. So to do that, the trick we use is quite interesting. You take the data, split the data. You take the data into train and test. So what you do is you take the data, typically you'll do it as a 70-30 split or something like that, for example. You take the data, suppose it has a thousand rows, you will keep 700 rows aside as training data and 300 rows as test data, something like that. Or you can take some ratio you take. <clears throat> now what you do is you hide the test data under the pillow. You train, you build a model on only the training data. So the steps are, steps, number one, split the data 
into train and test right hide the test data data under the pillow sort of under the pillow so your training model your algorithm does not see it while learning when it is doing graduate learning fitting it sees only the training data only the training data that is a very important realization you need to hide half the data a little bit uh, one portion of the data not exactly hide but some portion non zero portion of the data you must go and hide now why will we hide what happens is that number 3 go build models build models of different complexity to fit the data to fit the training data so you may build a line model a quadratic model a cubic model a quintic model and so on and so forth and now what will you do now comes the crucial step uh, let me put it in a different color now comes the crucial step look for the error in the test data in other words which model is able to predict test data best right so what happens is you took some data away and now you feed your model that has been built you give it a test data test and you look at y hat test and compare it to y hat the y test because you know you have kept uh, kept this data under the pillow you look for that and you pick the model which has the lowest test error right because test is the real proof how well is it able to uh, predict on data the model has not seen because that's the closest you can come to simulate in future data data that will come hereafter you hide it from the model and you say that so uh, this is a crucial step guys are we understanding this journey guys, any any uh, feedback is, is this simple you take the data you split it into parts and oh goodness my mouse is again misbehaving uh, give me a second I need to fix this is happening here oh. guys what are you seeing on my screen uh, nothing it's blank nothing black, black. Black mouse. i will just uh, unshare the screen and share it back again something uh, that is strange is going on uh, okay. Mm. Guys, give me a moment. Let me see if I can get another mouse. One moment.
All right, guys, I'm back and I'm hoping now it is not the mouse, it is something to do with one note. Let me see. Can you save the document and reopen again? Yes, actually, I seem to have gotten back the. Yeah, I can save it, yes and do it. But okay, let me finish this thought. It's important I finish this thought. And uh, let me go to something else and then come back. Okay. Uh, all right, at this moment, I'm having a bit of technical difficulties. So what? let me just speak it verbally. So there is something called a bias variance trade-off. Huh? that we are seeing. What it means is there's a ground truth. You never know what is the real complexity of the ground truth before you have experimented with the data. So you will make models of different levels of complexity. And what will happen is there will be one model whose complexity will match the underlying truth, the ground truth. It would be the best model. Models that are simpler than that will have high bias errors. They're too biased or simpler. And models that are much more complex than the ground truth, they will overfit the data. So on test data, when you try it out with the test data, the data that you hit under the pillow, it will end up showing high variance errors, overfitting errors. So this is a trade-off. As you increase as you decrease the bias errors, the variance errors begin to go up. What happens is as you dial up the complexity, the bias errors will continuously decrease. So ask if you are sharing a screen, like I'm not, it's kind of as blank. Yes, indeed, it is blank, unfortunately. Uh, okay. This, I'm having some technical difficulty at this moment. Uh, okay. Something to do with, uh, anyway, uh, I will save all of this, these notes and send it to you. Uh, and we'll, I'll find what is the reason um, WebEx and uh, OneNote of Microsoft don't seem to be uh, going too well together, we should solve it. Maybe next time I'll use another thing, Zoom or go to meeting or something like that. Sir, I have a question. Yes. Uh, sir, can we use polynomial uh, regression to explain um, step functions or should it be continuous values? See, the moment you talk about uh, non-smooth functions, it gets complicated. Non-smooth okay. uh, function, right, is not differentiable. So polynomials won't represent it ever. These are discontinuous functions. Okay, so thank you. Build, uh, models, our underlying assumption usually is that unless there is a reason otherwise, we are looking for continuous smooth functions. We are, in one dimension, we are looking for continuous smooth curves. In higher dimensions, we are looking for continuous smooth surfaces. So that is the so, so, sir, if we're building a model based on, like, let's say, house price and, and then the increasing number of bedrooms, we have to assume it's a polynomial function instead yes, of a step. That is right. Yes, you cannot assume a step function. A step function would be a really bad, a bad assumption. Are we together? Okay. Uh, generally, you, in machine learning, you don't do, tend to do that. So I'm trying to open OneNote again, but for some reason it doesn't seem to like it. Uh, let me see if I can reopen it and we can continue. Otherwise, I'll go on to the lab part of it. Uh, anyway, we are in the last 20 minutes of it. So yeah, okay, my mouse seems to have come back. Uh, ordinarily. 
Go ahead. Uh, so how how do we differentiate between um, the curve and the linear uh, graph? Do we graph and visually see it, or how how do we? Yeah, actually, the answer is pretty unfortunate. In one dimension, we can just visualize the data. Your next lab will be that you visualize the data and you see, and you get an intuition on which model to pick. Right. But in higher dimensions, human beings, you know, evolutionarily, we have no organ. The eyes don't help us visualize higher dimensional data. The kind of data that we encounter these days are extremely high. You know, the hypothesis these days, like when even the data spaces are very high dimension. Uh, high is not just five or 10 dimensions. It's very common to encounter data, which is like 300,000 dimensions or 100,000 dimension data. So for us to visualize data in such very high dimensional spaces, we lose intuition. Uh, all our eyes, ears, nose, we, we give up on that. We can't directly see it, get an intuition into it. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is at that moment, you're flying blind. You're working with mathematical tools. So what you have to do is you start with simple models and you gradually dial up the complexity. And <clears throat> what will happen is the bias variance trade-off leads you to a situation where at some point, you know, the bias errors will keep falling down, the variance errors will keep going up, but there will be a point at which the total error, which is the sum of bias and variance errors, it will achieve a minima. Right? And that minima is the point we are looking for. Let me actually try another one. Uh, give me one second. I want to use another tool, Sketchbook. Maybe Sketchbook doesn't have this problem with WebEx. Uh, at this moment, I think seems to be. So, so I had another quick question. Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, when you say that um, you have a test data, mm -hmm. and uh, you present some test data and you hide the other, which means uh, you feed only part of the data, small part of the data, and not give it everything that you have. That is right. You hide the test data under the pillow. Yeah, so you don't feed that into that black box that we are talking about. Yeah, when you're building the black box, see, there are two phases. First, you build the black box, your model, your algorithm, you train your algorithm, the learning process takes place. Don't give it the whole data, because if you give the whole data, it will go and overfit, and you would not know that you have high variance errors. Mm -hmm. You can only find that, that, that your model has overfit. If you hide some data under the pillow and try your model against the data the model uh, did not see during the training process. Right? So it couldn't have a fit to the data that's hiding under your pillow. And that data will help you discover if your model has overfit. Mm. That is it, guys. Eh? That's what you do. So Afif, in the same line, I had another question. Uh, mm -hmm. So you said 30, 70 about the quantitative split of the test and the train. Yes. Um, is there something to the quality of the test? Uh, uh, is there a way that you could sample the test in such a way that it will not represent the train? So something we should know about. Yes, exactly. That is a very, very good question. See what happens, guys, is when you split the data, you must make every effort to ensure that test data is representative of reality. And both training data and test data are representative of reality. But if you don't watch out for that bias, if you have training data which has a hidden bias, then it will perform badly on the test data and it will perform badly on the reality. So uh, since I can't write more guys at this moment, I'll stop, we'll do it next time. I'll just tell you a story about biases in the data, test and, the test and train biases. The story, I don't know how true it is, but it is often given in the, uh, commun in the machine learning uh, data science communities. Once the US Army was in a 
I mean, came to a startup and said, all this AI and machine learning, can you look at a picture of a vehicle and tell whether it's a civilian vehicle or a military vehicle? For the obvious reason that if you're targeting a vehicle, you, you want to target only enemy uh, military vehicles. You don't want to hit civilians. So can there be an AI algorithm that can do that? And the startup said, well, of course we can do that. We can, that's what machine learning is for. So just give us a lot of pictures. So the army went back and told its soldiers, take a lot of pictures of civilian vehicles and then take a lot of pictures of military vehicles and send it to the startup. The startup got boxes and boxes, huge quantities, well, digital, a huge number of uh, pictures. Now it went through those photos, those picture files, and uh, it trained, actually it happened that it trained a neural network on it. In the lab, they did, they even did the test and training split. Uh, they randomly shuffled the data, hit some test data under the pillow. On the training data, they tried out. And uh, what would happen is their results would be perfect in the lab, very high good results. Then the military came, the army came and says, is it working? And they said, yes, absolutely, it's working. Uh, let's try it out. So they went and get, got more data of their own that the algorithm had not seen. So they asked the soldiers, give us more pictures of military and a civilian vehicle. So the soldier said, yes, sir, and got more pictures. And even those pictures passed in the lab, very, very accurate distinction between military and civilian vehicles. There's an interesting catch to the story though. When that algorithm was deployed in production, the entire thing failed miserably and everybody was confused. Now, why is it that the same algorithm works just fine in the lab, even on new data, doesn't work on new data in a theater of war in, a, in the field. And they were really scratching their head till somebody noticed something, a very interesting bias, inherent bias in the data. The data had one bias. All the pictures of military, so when do soldiers take pictures of the military vehicles? Well, either early in the morning when they are going about to go out on their duties of touring the, you know, tour duties or going out into the city. They would just take military vehicle pictures and how would you do that? They would just take pictures of each other's vehicles, lots of military vehicles. In the morning and late in the evening when they would come back again, there would be lots of military vehicles parked in the campus and they would take lots and lots of pictures. But when would they see the civilian vehicles? It would be apparently in the daytime, uh, when uh, in broad daylight, they would be touring the cities and so forth and take lots of pictures of civilian. Now, very interesting thing, even though you followed all the process correctly, uh, the test and train data had no bias. The overall data set itself has an inherent bias. The, the, the bias was that all the military vehicles, their pictures were taken during very low light conditions, you know, early morning or late evening. So the ambient light was low, whereas all the civilian vehicle pictures were taken in broad daylight. Right? So the ambient light was high. So what the milit what the algorithm picked up on very quickly is just look at the ambient light. Now, well, that algorithm is far more complex than our linear and polynomial models. Those are deep neural networks, computational networks, and so forth. But uh, one way or the other, it picked up on the ambient light as the factor. And uh, because uh, neural networks are a black box, you can't see exactly how it is thinking. It's a little hard to do that. Uh, you couldn't see why it was making the mistake. It took a long time to realize that. So that is what bias in the data does. So the data inherently can be can come to you as bias like that, or even if the data is proper, you have to make sure that the yes, the sample whatever data you were given is a sample of reality. It it doesn't have bias, which is the first situation. Second situation is given the data when you split it into test and train. Once again, you have to make sure that neither the test nor the train data has developed any specific bias. For example, if you're looking at the height of children uh, based on age, right? 
you should not do such a thing that all the training data are male and all the test data are female. You know, boys and girls, boys of different height, age and height, and girls of different age and height. Uh, because the regression curve, the function curve that predicts the boy's height with respect to an age would be different from the, the curve which would be for girls, the line that would be for girls, isn't it? And so mm -hmm. you have to watch out for the bias in the data. It's very, very important to do that. So that is it. Any other questions, guys? So the the bias and the variance are both kind of errors. How do we know we are measuring the bias versus the variance on uh, real data? Yes. So that is the trade-off. What you do is you don't know. What you have to do is build a lot of models of different complexity, and see which gives you the lowest total error. At some point, you know, bias errors will keep going down for more and more complex models, and variance errors will keep on increasing. But there will be a sweet spot at which the bias errors have come down, but the variance errors have not become too much. And that point where these two things cross over is the point that you're looking for. Are we together? So, so the, the understanding is when we start with the simple models, we assume that we have bias, and then as a new, we tune the models into more complex. Um, if it predominantly the error becomes variance, is that the understanding? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, please say that again. When we start with a small, simple model, what we see as an error might be bias, but as and when we apply more complex models, the error tends to be of the variance side. That is true. That is true. And that is it. So I would encourage you to go and read chapter at this moment in the textbook. Uh, let me give you the chapters to read. This topic is actually a crucial topic, and it is the section 2.2 and 2.3. Uh, sorry, 2.2 actually. Much of 2.2 is devoted to this. So, uh, and 2.2 uh, all the way up to, two, yeah, 2.2. So guys, read chapter 2.2. It's unfortunate that something fishy is happening with WebEx and this uh, thing. I'll try to have it fixed uh, by next time so we have a better experience. Now, but what I would like to do is uh, show you the labs and I'll send you guys the notes for the labs. All right. So, um, are you guys game for it? That is, if my machine cooperates here. Yeah. Ask if one question, if the data itself has a bias, how do you actually identify that? Yeah, that is a problem. In fact, this is a classic case, right? You can't. You, can't. you can make your best effort not to, not to make that mistake, but you can. It's very hard not to. And a bias seeps in in very subtle ways. Today, we live in a world in which a people have extraordinary faith in AI, extraordinary faith in these models that we build, with sometimes pretty disastrous consequences. For example, one company released a facial recognition system. And facial recognition systems are particularly problematic these days. So one, they exposed, it's a pretty large company, they, exp they created a, a service that you can give it any face online and it will recognize and tell you who it is. It see, obviously the company believed that it was fairly accurate, which is why they were selling it. And it's one of the biggest companies uh, without naming it. So then somebody did a simple experiment, uh, which is quite remarkable. Somebody just took the U US government from the US government, from the Congress, they took the Black Caucus, the, the set of all congressmen or senators who are uh, uh, Afro-Americans or Black, and they fed, they, they showed each of those pictures, their pictures, uh, to the algorithm and asked, who is it? And guess what the algorithm said for each of them? 
it uh, uh, or at least for most of them if i if i'm right i don't remember the exact details but it identified almost all the senators uh, to be uh, various kinds of rapists and serial killers and murderers and thugs uh, which is uh, not at all uh, obviously uh, pleasant so right. what went wrong uh, th this became actually quite an issue i believe it was last year it became quite an issue uh, there, there was obviously the black caucus was not amused by this and they were very concerned that this sort of bias is there today a lot of these facial recognition systems we know for a fact that they do very very poorly on uh, uh, minorities they do very poorly with women uh, sometimes right they do much better with the caucasian uh, crowd and so you ask yourself where did the bias come in well, it turns out that when you work in these companies, uh, most of the data that you have access to is of the mainstream data. You may not realize it, but the mainstream data that you have collected, uh, if you have just been gathering data by taking pictures of each other, or taking pictures of people in the street and so forth, it will dominantly be of uh, uh, the, the Caucasian people. And so the algorithm will work quite well with them. But there wasn't enough training data for ethnic minorities and racial minorities and uh, women. And so whatever reason, because the training wasn't enough, it actually does very poorly with them. And it is quite a concern. You never can know whether you have subtle hidden bias in the data. And when it blows up in your face, it's a huge problem. It is one reason there is a strong movement these days for something called explainable AI or explainable machine learning. In other words, a, mo a model, see the kind of models we are learning today. These are linear and polynomial models. These are very explainable. You can see the values beta naught, beta one, beta two. So it can tell you uh, why it believes it made the prediction, why it made the prediction. It can show you the coefficients and you can see that this factor matters more, this factor matters less and so forth. But uh, with our modern generation, uh, some of the algorithms, they are literally black boxes. You don't know what they are doing. A deep neural network, for example, uh, is doing a gradient descent in a, uh, it, can you guess how many dimensional space, the parameter space or the hypothesis space, how many dimensions does it have? Can, would anybody like to hazard a guess? Nine? No, just oh, guess. A few billion? <laughs> <laughs> yes, today we are looking at um, a world in which we do this gradient descent and this whole uh, learning in the parameter spaces are like 500 million dimensions. So you imagine how complex it is, it's bizarrely complex. We use massive hardware that runs for a very, very long time and then produces a model after many days produces a model. And that model uh, has 500 million parameters. How in the world can you understand what exactly it is doing? It's beyond comprehension. So um, if it goes wrong, you don't know. See, it may go wrong for specific areas, like for example, the facial recognition system. It worked for the majority, but that's not good enough. It didn't work for the minorities of all sorts of uh, all kinds, right? So you, you wouldn't know. So a new area, which is very uh, hot these days, is to say, well, even this black box, how do we derive interpretability out of them and see if there is bias? You can never shoot a <laughs> model, right? So ultimately, so <laughs> your model is not completely accurate at any point in time, so. I, I apologize for this. No, you. Um, your model is? Not completely accurate, and yes, at some point, right? Yeah. Yes, uh, you never know. See, here's the thing. Uh, when in the next lab, you'll see uh, a famous quote by Box, uh, a great data scientist, what you would call a statistician of a previous generation. Uh, he said that all models are wrong. <laughs> I heard that. Yeah. Inherently, all models are wrong, but some are useful. We were never able to pursue useful. to the right. Yes. In science, you know, there are no right useful, right? It's a peculiar thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
research what is for summer use? Summer useful, exactly. So the idea is that all of science is not the pursuit of what is right, but what is effective, what is useful. For example, is the theory of, uh, for example, uh, Newton said the gravity is given by, you know, M1, M2 over R squared up to a proportionality constant, Newton's law of gravity. And then for many years, it worked just fine. Till Einstein came and then he put another theory. Right? Now that theory agrees with Newton for uh, small distances and not large mass. I mean, for most situations it agrees, but there are situations in which we know that the Newtonian gravity is wrong and it's the Einsteinian gravity that gives you better answers, the more accurate answers. So you may say therefore that Einstein was right, but that too is not the way you look at in science. In science, you say Einstein's theory is a better theory. It's a more effective theory. And data agrees more with Einstein. The observations agree with it. But is it right? In fact, we happen to know that it cannot be right at this moment. Uh, relativity does not agree with quantum mechanics, uh, quantum field theory. And these two fundamental and brilliant theories that underlie physical nature both of them disagree with each other. So there is some deeper underlying theory that may someday unite these two. So these are effective models at best. And so it goes on and uh, bringing it back home. In machine learning, all the models you build, you'll never know, you know, you write a function that approximates the data. But is it the correct answer? You wouldn't know because uh, you are not being told the underlying function that produced it. If you knew that function, there was no point in doing data science. You already know the answer, but you'll never know the answer. All you can do is come closer and closer to it. Yeah, got it. The learning continues, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So guys, it's uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, I would have liked to do the lab, but this uh, WebEx is behaving uh, quite uh, peculiarly uh, in this particular case. My desktop seems to have at this particular moment a frozen. So what I will do is the lab part, I will I will send you the PDF to all of you, huh? but let me give you an explanation of what, uh, or sort of a preview of what is there in the PDF. It is the same PDF I gave you the last time. In the last time you remember that I talked about the Galton data set, we talked about Nightingale and the snow. The Nightingale data set is, uh, of course, Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War of uh, 1853 to 1856. She, the, it's a well-known story, of course. We, uh, she went there to nurse and take care of the wounded soldiers. She was taking care of the wounded soldiers of three armies, the Russian, the Brit, and the French. She had no partiality. But when she was doing it, and so obviously she was a person of great compassion and commitment, when she was doing it, she observed that most of the mortality in that war was not from bullets, not from actual wounds, uh, battle wounds. They were actually from uh, malnutrition and poor hygiene and unsanitary conditions in the hospitals. And so, and she presented that data that you saw in the notes as the so-called two roses. I'm mentioning this for those of you who are new, that uh, visualization. And that visualization was profoundly influential in helping her change the medical field itself. In fact, um, she convinced the powers that be and established the modern practice of nursing as a profession, not as uh, something uh, done by non-professionals, but as a profession in its own right, different from the doctor's profession. And it is heavily based on keeping the hospitals very sanitary and uh, and so forth. And the effect has been profound. If you go to modern hospitals, you see they are kept very clean and so forth. So that data is of high value. Uh, let us walk in the footsteps of the giants. We'll start with that. The second data set was uh, John Snow's data set, the cholera data set, which pinpointed that probably the cause of cholera is um, germs in the water that get, uh, when people drink the water, they get it. Right, so she uh, he was more leaning towards the germ theory rather than the previous 
They are a small theory which believe that diseases are spread by bad air. The third data set, uh, which was in the homework or in the lab, was the Galton's data set, which was about regression towards the mean. The Florence Nightingale data set, I asked you guys to just do exploratory analysis, not visualize it. Visualization is a bit hard at that, the visualization that she did. It's a little bit more advanced when we go into Edward visualization in depth. You will learn how to make those beautiful visualizations, but it's a bit early for that at this moment. The second one is uh, obviously uh, Galton. I left it as, uh, I mean, not Galton, the snow. I left it as an exercise. It was a simple one. I hope you have done it. The third one is Galton, and I essentially gave the solution to the Galton one. If I remember right, I gave the solution in Python. Now to the notes, I have added um, a few more things. One of them is the concept of a formal grammar for data manipulation. So it is called the grammar of data. You, you do different manipulations of data. Think of SQL. You take some rows. You, you filter out some columns with a where clause. You put some order, some group by, and so forth. Uh, it is a set of operations on the data. So if you think of it as a set of operations, you can actually construct a very complex uh, data manipulation pipeline using simple primitives, simple verbs, or things like that. So uh, it talks about that, and it talks about something called the tidy data. That When data is in one particular form called the tidy data, then it is more intuitive and uh, dealing with it for both exploratory analysis and machine learning becomes far easier. So that is that. And to illustrate that, uh, I have taken a weather data set. Uh, for a few years, at a, at the weather in some about 36 odd cities, what was the weather like? Uh, what was the temperature like on different days or different uh, days or months? And what was the pressure like? What was the humidity like? What was the so on and so forth, wind speed, uh, things like that. So um, there is an analysis of that. That analysis I have done because this whole data wrangling and the grammar of data and uh, tidy data, they form core concepts. So I have given the solution uh, in both R and in Python. They are very close to each other. R, they use the dplyr library in Python. The pandas comes built in with it. Next time when we meet, we will uh, go over those uh, solutions. But I highly encourage you to try it on your own. The next data set is the iris data set, which is a very, very simple data set. Um, it, is, it is sort of a rite of passage. Every person or every student, almost every, uh, who has gone through and done machine learning, data science, etc. has in the early stage done an analysis on the iris data set. It is a data set that was gathered by um, a botanist who um, went out to a field and observed three species of iris flower. And he measured the length of the petals, you know, the flower part of it, and the sepal, you know, the green part that's under the flower, that holds the flower together. The length and width of the petals and sepals. So there are only four attributes and use that. Uh, and then the, there is the species. So while at this moment we are just exploring the data, later on we'll build machine learning models, in particular regression models to predict all sorts of things. So we'll see how much can you predict petal length from the, let's say, sepal length, and so on and so forth. Uh, we'll, we'll do those exercises in the future. So in any case, I'll send these notes over to all of you who are in the mailing list. Those of you who just joined today, please drop me an email. Again, those of you who did not receive some of the material, for example, are not a part of Slack mailing list because you didn't receive an invite, let me know, I'll invite you. If you have received an invite, please do join. I remember I sent, uh, I have received only half the acceptance compared to the invites I sent. 
Slack is important. We are going to engage using Slack. Also the Google mailing list, I'll add all of you to the Google mailing list. Right? And uh, finally, uh, those of you who haven't paid yet, I believe there are a few of you, who are new students who have not paid, uh, please reach out to Prachi and uh, she will uh, help you with the process. So is due now. We right. use a uh, general channel uh, for communication or? No, no, no. Once I see all of you, I'll add you to a special channel, which is a closed channel only for uh, participants of this workshop. And I'll add, uh, bring you in. And uh, those of you who are new uh, and have joined just today, welcome to the workshop. I hope you enjoyed it. I wish we didn't have technical difficulties. It is uh, actually the very first a virtual classroom that I have ever held. But I suppose with the coronavirus, we are doing a lot of things for the first time in our life. Any feedback, guys? So we'll follow this sort of a format, but next time we'll be more lab heavy. We'll walk through code, a lot of code walkthroughs. But uh, any feedback, guys? Any anything? Yeah, I felt the. Uh, I didn't have an issue with the meeting, and I, I felt it was very well communicated. Um, so that's the feedback from me. I think uh, I didn't really miss not being in the class. It was. Except for the uh, issues at the end, I think uh, it's a good medium from my end. Not sure oh, about others. Yeah. Thank you. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll certainly go and share this uh, recording with all of you in YouTube. I'll share because I'll put it as a private video. In other words, only people who are in the classroom can see this video, and I will send you the PDF of the handwritten notes. And so with that, I'd like to end this meeting, guys. You guys can stay and ask questions if you want. Otherwise, let's conclude today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good evening. evening. Bye. Thank you, Asif. Thank you, Asif. You're welcome. Thank you, Asif. Thank you.